Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 117. Today, High Fidelity and I are going to be talking to a Ukrainian journalist and author named Maxim Arastavi. He wrote a very important book called Russian Colonialism 101. It's incredibly brilliantly illustrated by Ukrainian artists, but we're going to be talking about showing up for resistance. Have a listen. Welcome to RadPod, Maxim. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Um, I would love for you just to fill our viewers in a little bit more about your background and how you came to write this amazing book. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, unfortunately not that often that uh, um, this topic is getting platformed. Uh, in America on American media. So I'm extra grateful for you guys having me. Um, I'm a Ukrainian journalist uh, and uh, an author of uh, Russian Colonialism 101 guidebook. And in the last 10 years, I have been trying to mainstreaming global awareness about this phenomena of Russian colonialism and imperialism. I myself, I come from uh, one of the Ukrainian regions that suffered from Russian colonialism almost the, uh, the most through settler colonialism, through genocides, through aggressive Russification. And I might byproduct of this uh, of this trauma and this violence. You know, I was raising raised in the Ukrainian speaking families, uh, but I was taught to speak uh, Russian first. Um, lots of our family were missing. Uh, we weren't proud of our roots or didn't even know much about where we come from and uh, um, uh, what what our roots are. So for me, you know, trying to through my work as a journalist to establish even the truth about my own uh, uh, roots, about my own ancestry, um, I started seeing certain patterns and realizing that what is my family's uh, uh, facing and the the uh, um, the uh, identity erasure and the uh, um, the the trauma that my family is going through and went through is not something unique. And lots of our Ukrainian families went through. And after that, I started seeing patterns uh, even more so, you know, when my friends or my colleagues from places like Moldova or Kazakhstan or um, somewhere else, uh, say in Poland or in Estonia, start sharing the same stories. For me, it was obvious that uh, we're dealing with a larger system and what is happening in Ukraine at the moment, this horrific ongoing genocide. This is not the first time it happened, even in Ukraine. And this is not even the first time it happened to Ukraine. There's dozens and dozens of nations throughout centuries who went through similar violence. That's why I, I'm so determined for people to see the pattern and to realize that uh, we're dealing with a with a culture of abuse, not just one regime, one man. And uh, until we're not seeing it, we will not be able to even come up with adequate policy solutions and decisions and make uh, adequate steps towards ending this. Thank you so much for that profoundly beautiful, poignant and tragic intro. 
that culture of abuse, I think, is um, a very, very important facet uh, and something that we're going to talk more about. Before we talk about the specifics of your book, I would love for you to inform our viewers on historically how dangerous reporters and writers and playwrights and poets and philosophers have been to Russian imperialism. I learned uh, last year about the executed Renaissance where under mm. Stalin, there was a purge of, uh, of writers. And can you tell people a bit about that and why you feel in this moment, it's so important for writers to continue to push truth out? Because I believe we're living in a time of grave deception. And I believe people are gonna stop uh, writing truth because they're in fear, which is understandable. But I think that what stands between us and a total annihilation of reality are the writers willing to tell people what's actually truly going on. I think when um, I even started uh, putting together this book, um, or, uh, your first first weeks of the full scale invasion in 2022, um, I, I mean, it started as a Twitter thread first, but then I wanted to make specifically a book, a physical book, and for for many reasons. But one of the reasons, of course, is uh, the one that you mentioned. Um, as the Russian tanks actually started rolling uh, in my own ancestral village, one of the th first things that uh, the invaders did, they went to archives and libraries, and they started um, throwing out and burning Ukrainian books and Ukrainian language books, uh, trying to erase as much as possible of indigenous knowledge out there in physical forms. And this has been you know, happening for almost three years now, every time uh, Russians uh, um, in, invade and, and steal another piece of Ukrainian land. And when you research the patterns uh, of uh, and the playbooks of Russian colonialism throughout uh, decades and generations, you see the same being played out everywhere they go. Um, you know, trying to not only physically erase the uh, voices of uh, indigenous uh, knowledge, poets and writers, um, uh, anyone who speaks out and anyone who uh, does does not want to get <clears throat> so-called civilized by Russian empire, um, you realize that actually producing books in these times is as important as possible. And for um, Ukraine in general, alter culture have always helped Ukrainians survive in the darkest times. And it is, I would say, it's the backbone of our resistance with everything else fails. So in the end, it was a very natural idea for me to combine Ukrainian art made during this genocide and, in fact, oriented journalism in the, in the form of a book, um, just to ensure that we keep producing books, we keep writing books, and we create as much as possible as I was seeing Ukrainian books being on fire, even in my uh, own ancestral village. Um, it, it felt like a responsibility to create as many new books as possible for me at that point. Thank you so much for that. One more from me and then high five you next, please. Um, uh, you said that the project started as a Twitter thread. Did you ever mm. expect it to get the traction that it got? And when you just initially had this idea and decided to start posting your thoughts did you expect the world to respond in the way it did this is this has been a thread seen all over the world to be honest no because i've been uh, doing that research at that time for already almost 8 years and uh i cannot uh, i cannot tell you how many times i've been you know, d dismissed and ridiculed for a lot of people, including the West, including America, saying, well, you know, this is not the real topic. Uh, the things you're describing, colonialism, imperialism, they cannot be applicable to Russia. This is all like imaginary things. It's not serious. Um, I was regularly kicked out of any spaces where people would discuss colonialism because they would say that Ukrainians have no place in these spaces and they cannot share their trauma or, you know, be invalidated this way. So, of course, when the um, full-scale invasion was about to start, and I started this threat uh, several days before, 
I was exceptionally frustrated because as a journalist, I was watching all this 24 hour coverage all, all over about Ukraine and people were saying things. Well, this seems like unprecedented. This cannot be. People were shocked and puzzled how this can, you know, uh, this possibility can even exist that Russia will invade and commit a full scale genocide. But for me, it was 100% obvious that it will happen because it has happened many times before. And we're seeing the playbook developing and used in real time that Russia already used. So if you guys just pay more attention to what Russia did before, even during, you know, ongoing century, um, the, the surprise wouldn't be even there and you would understand what we're dealing with. So in, in this regard, um, I was frustrated, but of course I wasn't, I was really shocked that in the end, this topic started getting mainstream. The threat got tens of millions of, of views, but the, you know, um, in general, even those people who used to ridicule me from establishment academic circles, now they talk about the phenomena of Russian imperialism and colonialism and, uh, things are slowly but uh, changing in that perception of the, of uh, modern day Russia. Thank you so much. High fidelity. I understand your your feelings of frustration. Uh, for four years now, I've been saying that Elon Musk is a problem, mm -hmm. and it's only in the last six months to a year that people are finally trying to understand what I'm saying when I say that about him. Um, Ukraine has obviously experience with him since he disabled Starlink uh, in the Black Sea, interrupting Ukrainian military operations. But the thing I'd like to ask you, we were talking before the show, and uh, we were talking about how, you know, it's, it's not just Putin, it's not just the Russian government or the military intelligence, there's a whole system of thought there. And what we are facing is much larger and much more dangerous than anyone even considers. You and I, you know, we are obviously men of imagination. We can see the horror coming. Um, how would you explain to people that Syria is part of this, Israel is part of this, the the atrocities in Ukraine are part of this, the the bombing, the explosions in weapons factories in Europe and the United States are part of this. How do you explain that to people that this is, this is literally the fight of our lives? I think I often start with uh, pointing out that uh, Putin did not make Russia, but Russia made Putin. And uh, my book, uh, for example, it focuses on just one aspect of Russian colonialism, uh, and that is uh, invasions of sovereign nations in the last uh, 111 years. And some people ask why, you know, why I, I, I focus just on 111 years, um, but only because there is a certain invasion pattern crystallized uh, from Moscow around the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and uh, but it doesn't doesn't mean that that pattern and the invasions and the phenomenon of Russian colonialism did not exist before the beginning of the uh, 20th century. The mass murdering history of Russian colonialism spans several centuries, starting actually with the moment of the founding of Moscow as a remote colonial outpost by Ukrainians in 1147. The, uh, on the lands that did not even belong to us. And of course, uh, because Russian empire has been uh, so wealthy and um, in, investing so much over centuries into rewriting uh, history and also painting out this uh, mythical image of Russia abroad, um, these are the facts that lots of people uh, abroad do not even uh, know at the moment. The infiltration of Russian imperial thought and Russian imperial mythology into, for example, Western intellectual uh, institutions is horrific. There are so many journalists, academics, politicians in the West who still do not believe that Russia is a colonial power uh, because, you know, 
because, for example, they're also blind by the Western um, uh, perception of what is colonialism. They think that the colonialism is only what you know Western people, white people did to people uh, of color in South uh, Global South, and they refuse to accept that this phenomena is much more prevalent and and spans much more uh, regions in the world. So. I'm trying to, first of all, to make people open minded and to learn more about what is happening beyond the Western uh, world and what has happened. And also, I want people to first and foremost to learn the stories and learn the names and see the struggle in average stories. I think this is where the impact comes the most because my book shows and, and beyond, people often come from places like uh, Africa and South America and Australia. And when they hear the stories that we share of people who went through Russian colonization, and then they recognize the stories of their ancestors in it, uh, of course, it's not identical, it's not the same. But that's where something starts clicking for people. And they, they probably start in seeing the same patterns and realizing, wait, Wait a minute, that this does sound very quite similar to what my ancestors went through or to what I went through dealing with colonization and imperialism. Thank you so much for that, um, Hi-Fi and Maxim. Um, I've been writing a lot about um, the last winter of the Weimar Republic. I've been focusing on what happened prior to Hitler getting into power. And one of the things that that I've noticed that really relates to what just happened in America is the, you know, Trump and Vance are controlled by oligarchs, which I just wrote about how when oligarchs control politicians, uh, it can look a lot like uh, 90s Russia, which is something that a lot of people are very concerned about right now in my country but they've been using a very cruel and effective playbook. And that cruel and effective playbook has ties to French colonialism because in Germany, when the French used soldiers of color to occupy the Rhine, that allowed German propagandists to start putting out racist fake news. Nothing was real about it, but it was these black soldiers that they weaponized the fear of of other and use this uh, this fear to uh, print lies about what these soldiers were doing to German women. And what happened is ultimately the historian said, hey, the people who were really scary and you should have been frightened of were the propagandists. But I'm, I, I bring this up because there is a fever in America of people believing stories that aren't true and we are not having any efficacy here in America to tell them these stories aren't true. And in Germany, the Germans finally woke up because there were bombs overhead. And I know that uh, Ukraine has been targeted with disinformation, misinformation and lies. How is there anything from your experience uh, on this topic? that you can say to America, even after essentially the oligarchs just won the war, about how their minds have been duped and how that's part of how people become a colonialized nation. First, they kind of come for the for the stories they tell you that, uh, you know, affect your mind. I think disinformation is uh, is a huge part of the uh, any empire's existence because I think when I look at the uh, once again Western coverage or how things are being discussed about what is happening in Ukraine, what is often missing there for me is just the consideration and focus on on humans because people talk about geopolitics and lands and, you know, some uh, NATO, economics, gas, oil, all these big things. And basically the conversation always breaks down that, oh, it's about big guys figuring out something for the little people. And, uh, you know, basically people never keep in the center and focus that this is affecting actual uh, people's lives. But 
imperialism is actually is a lot about disinformation is a lot about ideology first because I'm once again I'm not the most uh, smart per person on I'm not a researcher I'm not an academic on this topic and my work is actually to amplify those smart people coming from the region telling uh, those stories and explaining the this phenomena but the way I describe this is for my myself um, I put a, a clear distinction between colonialism and imperialism and colonialism for me is actually technicality of how you steal someone else's home. So you come and what do you do? You create, um, in, in my book, I paint this uh, a formula of gaslighting, invading, exterminating, a certain steps that Russian colonialism always does to uh, steal someone else's home, land, and, or, uh, or country. So this is the technical part of it. How do I do it? But imperialism is more about ideology. How do I excuse myself for uh, doing all this abuse and, uh, and violence? And for Russian colonialism, this uh, ideology, this mythology is very extensive. And it goes, it goes down to many points, but one of the most uh, prominent is one is that Russia is trying to civilize uh, the, the rest and bring civilization and actually doing some good. So they're coming to your home to steal your uh, to steal your home or to colonize you, not because they just want um, to grab whatever you own, which is in the end, this is why they're coming. But they excuse it saying, well, you're not civilized enough. Your culture is not great enough as ours. You're, you need our protection. You need to liberate. Um, you need us to liberate you and so on and so forth. So I think this is what often triggers me or this is what concerns me. Because when Americans look at Russia, they always feel or see oftentimes something great. It could be evil grade, it, it can be bad grade, uh, but it's something, you know, great and something to pay attention to and something to value. And there is little to no concern to actual people who have been colonized throughout the centuries and who are being colonized at the moment. But I often ask those people, when you think of, of Russia and you think right away, great, great culture, great country, First of all, start asking yourself very critical questions. Why do I think this is great? Because this is where the marker of imperialism already comes. If we think that some culture is great and some other culture is not, this is guys already imperialist. I'm already thinking through imperial gaze because in the normal world, every culture is valid, every culture is unique, and every culture has its place on its earth. And second, if I already think about Russia as great, uh, and Russia is the largest country by landmass in the earth, do I really think that these kind of countries, when you look back in the history, come together in friendships, handshakes, and friendly paths? No, the, 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 um, the, the size of these countries come together through violence, through imperialism, through conquests. This is how, this, how, how it has always been. This is what America's history has always also been partially. Um, so these are you know, very critical questions that I always encourage people to ask. And I think, unfortunately, back in America, they're not that often um, being discussed in the public spaces. Not at all. <laughs> That's why we're so glad you're with us today. Uh, hi, Fai, do you have something you want to chime in with? I do. Uh, what is the sense of the Ukrainian people as it now appears that Putin's puppet has won the presidency of uh, the American people? I, I am not here to, you know, speak on behalf of Ukrainians or anyone, um, anyone else except me. I, um, I, I feel that the bigger picture that we should be keeping in mind is what is uh, the, the what is happening in Ukraine at the moment. And the fight and the resistance that Ukrainians are uh, yeah. going through and mounting for three years now, 
you know, yeah. let's just remember that the rest of the world would give Ukrainians three days. It's been three years and it's, it's happening and it's still, um, uh, and Ukraine still stands because this fight is much bigger than just land or economics or, um, you know, uh, some pettiness between the neighbors. This fight is first and foremost for values and values of freedom, values of democracy, values of human dignity and respect to human dignity, because this is something that the, the other side does not respect whatsoever. It does not believe. And I think this realization that this fight is for the values is, is much better on the other side than on the our collective uh, side of the free world. Uh, why? Because look at how they're cooperating, how they talk to each other, how they uh, arm each other, uh, how, you know, Northern Korean troops are marching already tens of thousands on European soil in the in this war. Iran sends all the weapons possible, drones to, to Russia. China also finances Russia, trying to, to ensure that it stands and wins. Um, so they're cooperating and they know what at stake. And they've been talking, they've been uh, scheming and planning together. On our side, we're still are not able to give Ukraine at least what Ukraine asks to, to win. You know, the Russian air, air bases and Russian airspace is better protected than Ukrainian one just because of these policies of, you know, not uh, provoking or not escalating or whatnot. Uh, so many Ukrainians keep dying uh, every day just because of the failure of collective uh, free world to step up and to ensure that Ukraine uh, wins, not only survives the day. And I think for empire and for imperialism, once again, it's always important, um, you know, the narratives and always important the stories that are, are they're developing. And it's obvious that for Russia and for Kremlin, the messages that they're get, getting that they can do whatever they want still. And there is more consideration to the well-being of Moscow and the Kremlin that there is consideration to the well-being of their victims. Um, so today, just you know, another day, but three horrific attacks on peaceful apartment blocks in Mykolaiv, Pryvirich, and my own uh, home city of Zaporizhia, where people start asking you know loudly the same questions why we don't have the same air protection that the russian air airfields where those bombs came from have and those guarantees that the west gives to russia that they forbid ukraine from striking back they forbid ukraine from um uh, def defending itself uh, itself through bombing those airfields and these are the questions that I think um, should be louder and we should be discussing them daily for sure, that we have these capacities to end this genocide. Like uh, in less than a week, uh, we're just still not coordinated enough and not feel bold enough to, to, to give that action a chance. Thank you so much for that thoughtful response. I've been doing a lot of soul searching on the why of it why when it's so clear this is the clearest battle of good and evil in our time and i believe that there is not a western leader or group of western leaders willing to disrupt petrol i think it has to do <clears throat> with the energy market i just don't think anybody has the courage to actually disrupt the second largest dis distributor of you know of petrol and and i i i don't i don't see any other reason why there would not be uh more support and that they wouldn't be noodling the margins unless you have other ideas i don't believe in the nuclear willy waving theory i really do i think it has to do with energy and not having the courage to disrupt uh how we've been living it, this is the the reason that you gave is exceptionally important. Thank you so much because um, when we look at you know, all these invasions that I uh, highlight in the book, there are 
over 48 of them in the span of uh, just I, I want to read that 48 invasions, millions of indigenous voices before us murdered or assimilated without telling their stories. Russian colonial empire has been hiding in plain sight for centuries. We survived to unmask it. We survived to uh, talk at the take the empire back. I just wanted people to know that that's right there in the book. The, the facts are right there at the very beginning when you explain the idea of it. 100%. And actually, if you look at the examples in each chapter, you can see clearly why would the uh, you know, Russian Empire come to those places. So when you look at the occupied and colonized lands, the, the majority of territory of Russia does not belong to uh, original Russians, Northern Asia, um, parts of Eastern Europe, so, you know, at some point Central Asia. Those are lands that are incredibly rich as natural resources. The majority, all, not the majority, all, oil that comes from Russia that the rest of the world comes, calls Russian is actually co coming from stolen lands of indigenous people in North, Northern Asia, in, uh, in Central Asia, in, uh, um, in Caucasus, and as, uh, in, in, used to be in places like Azerbaijan and so on. And I just love one of the you know, smartest, probably my favorite voice and researcher on Russian colonialism, uh, Dr. Botakoska Sembekova, she just gave a, a congressional, uh, she was on a congressional hearing just uh, the, the other uh, week in, in the U.S. And she often also points out that part of the reason why uh, the rest of the world and especially the free world remains blind to the to the phenomenon of Russian colonialism is just this huge discount that these natural resources come to them from Russia. Russian gas, Russian oil, because Russian empire is a petro empire first and foremost, and it thrives on 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 the exploitation of uh, uh, natural resources that it keeps stealing from indigenous lands and lands that did not belong. But you know, we can see this resistance to putting an end to this um, uh, to this addiction to uh, Russian oil and gas by the situation with a so-called Russian um, a shadow fleet, that Russia keeps earning hundreds of millions on the schemes that are now well known and exposed, including by Ukrainian activists, of these shadow tanker, oil, oil tankers go from Russia to Europe and then to the rest of the world and keep selling uh, albeit in the in the shady schemes, the same Russian oil and getting money back to the Kremlin to keep keep financing the ongoing genocide, and there are already very clear um, ways that the the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian activist civil society, uh, some international organizations, anti um, environment organizations also offer as a next step to uh, invoke sanctions and to put uh, to ensure that the scheme is dead and the you know it's it's as hard as it used to be in 2022 for russia to sell its natural resources once again that do not belong to russia to the rest of the world but we haven't seen any step and haven't seen any wave of these sanctions yet so this is super important thank you so much for bringing that up um i think it's a, it's a larger conversation of our addiction to petroleum and how we, uh, you know, we can put, uh, well, at least in Europe, we have so many wind turbines and, for example, Germany phased out nuclear power, but we don't talk about that it goes at expense of buying more from the places that, um, you know, like Russia, that steal those natural resources from indigenous people. Uh, this is incredibly important topic, um, not, not well discussed at all. Wow, I'm so grateful because uh, I just I needed that confirmation because I've been telling everybody that uh, it, it boils down to one word, petrol, and people are like, oh, oh, OK. And so thank you. And I did not know that history of the indigenous, uh, you know, areas in uh, Russia being dominated in order to uh, take their resources. It makes perfect sense. Uh, only one or two th more things from me, but one thing I wanted to bring up is we have a friend from Prague, Adam Severa, who also has been in Ukraine for the last few years working on various rescue missions, and he's also a reporter. 
And he believes that imperialism is the story that Putin is now telling himself, but that he's just a thief and that he's stolen everything from his country. And now he's going into other countries to steal everything that they have. And I would just love a comment from you on that. Um, and, and also, Americans are completely blind to the fact that Putin, ha Putin has been, uh, you know, indicted by the ICC for trafficking children, for being a war criminal. And I just feel like in America, there's just this incredible disconnect between what, what's really going on. And again, your book explains so much of it so beautifully, but any comment on any of that? That question was a hot mess, mm. but. <laughs> uh, this is one of the most heartbreaking and um, one of the most horroring uh, parts of the what is happening in Ukraine and the ongoing genocide, because when I start writing that thread, and of course, Part of the playbook of Russian colonialism invading other uh, places has been identity erasure. And one of the most common ways how to do that is to steal indigenous kids and send them to the boarding schools and uh, force them um, to really violent identity erasure. And when I was learning more and more of those uh, stories and facts, because even for me, the, most of them were uh, very surprising and uh, very heartbreaking. I started seeing the same playing out on the Ukrainian lands, including on the occupied and my ancestral lands, where kids are being taken away from their parents who, by the mere fact that they speak Ukrainian or refuse to take Russian passport, are uh, are declared uh, mentally ill. And their kids are being taken to stolen, kidnapped to the boarding schools, shipped to Russia, sent to other families. We, uh, you know, the, we've been tracking in general, over 20,000 confirmed cases of Ukrainian kids uh, being stolen and kidnapped on the occupied territories. But that figure is, of course, bigger because we cannot know for sure what is happening on the occupied lands. And for me, it was clear parallel that Russia has been doing that abs absolute with impunity for so many generations that even in 2024 for them it's not that uh, crazy to do because you know work before why not trying to do it now and what is happening with those kids when they uh, are you know they're forced to forget their language then they fed uh, propaganda about what is happening to to their country they're fed propaganda that they are not actual ukrainians that there is no such thing as Ukrainians, they've always been Russian. And there, you know, even when we have stories when kids are being uh, returned after two or three years back to their parents and they cannot speak a single word in Ukrainian or they think that their parents are these evil monsters, Nazis, and, you know, completely brainwashed. I think this is once again shows a certain serial pattern of behavior of colonialism, because once again, this is not just about land grab. When Russia comes, Russia ensures that the, the identities are also erased, that there is a russification, that the land belongs to them. And for any sorts of imperialism, including Western imperialism, that's been always a very efficient pattern of behavior, because you know, the most successful empires, they cannot just come and occupy it and run the place themselves. This is incredibly unproductive and it's very expensive. So what you do instead, you put in place a system that rewrites the identities of colonized people, uh, that um, indoctrinates them, brainwashes them, so they start running themselves the way the empire wants. And this is actually, I'm a byproduct of this system as well, once again. I was raised to completely hate my ancestry, hate my um, language, hate my roots, where I come from, being ashamed of who I am. I was raised to uh, speak Russian as my first language in a Ukrainian speaking family, just because my parents said, uh, thought that this is uh, a way for me to get out, to you know be more uh, Russian looking, so to say. 
And I didn't know anything about my history whatsoever until like later in my life. I didn't speak Ukrainian until later in my life, despite that it is my first language supposed to be. So how do you end up in this situation like that, living in Ukraine, living in Ukrainian family, not speaking your own even language and hating so much your uh, roots, not knowing your history? That's imperialism for you. And uh, I just, I would wish people pay more attention to these things um, and uh, the story of kidnapped kids. I think as much as it's heartbreaking, it is important to pay attention and understand why is it happening? Why Russia Russians are so transfixed on stealing our kids? That was just incredibly beautiful and sad and important. Um, I have one more question, but hi fi do you have anything on your mind? How do we make the world hold them accountable for this? How do we how do we make the world hold Russia accountable for what they're doing? Well, Ukraine first needs to win. Yeah. Because this is the only way. And if we look once again, I know that lots of lots of folks are often bored by the word history and nobody wants to look back at the history. But we're actually look living through the times where learning uh, lessons from the history can save actual lives. So when we look back at the history, how empires lived, how they operate, and how they fell, because if you all actually open my book, the first thing um, it says that the empire will fall. And I'm saying that not only as a manifestation uh, statement, uh, something that I uh, would like to happen, I also say it as a, as a historical fact all empires come to an end and all empires crumble down. But they never crumble down in, uh, once again, uh, peace negotiations and appeasement and handshakes. They always come down in military defeats. And when it comes to Russian empire, that military defeat can come only through the victory of Ukraine. So once there is a defeat, on the Ukrainian uh, battlefield, while once you know Ukrainians like myself can go back home uh, the, to the lands that were stolen, this is going to probably not will not end completely Russian Empire, but it will set the a trajectory towards the end for sure, because this will serve justice first and foremost, because the once again the stolen lands will be returned to the people that belong the historical justice will be served. That will also send the message to many other people who are resisting Russian colonization. Do not also let let's us not forget that there are dozens of nations who are still trapped within Russian uh, empire, colonized, um, who do not have any opportunity to leave, but do not have e any you know, military support or any political support. You know, people come to my book shows, they do not even know that those nations exist. They opened the book at the first time, they learned their names and, you know, understanding, although some of those nations are huge, like, for example, the Saha nation in Northern Asia, that if Russian empire crumbles down, it will become one of the largest states in the world uh, in terms of land mass. So I think the first step is always uh, is for Ukraine to win. And I emphasize over and over again that people should understand how it's incredibly important that each and everyone does something a little every day uh, because the Ukrainian resistance on its own, on just on the bravery of Ukrainian people and daily sacrifices, unfortunately, will not be successful. It couldn't have been successful without all this daily outpouring of support the nations platforming interviews, even like this one, because once again, we're not being that platformed often in America, despite America playing such a huge role in all of it in terms of uh, arms and in terms of uh, political support. So this is where it starts, but um, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a first but necessary step. In, the, in, in my work of studying the uh, disinformation and the uh, myths, uh, imperial myths. I think one of the biggest myths that separates the free world and the empires is the focus on what one person can do. So the empire always tells you that one person doesn't matter, that, you know, 
it's it's always going to be decided by big guys. It's all about the big geopolitics, and whatever you do as on your own literally doesn't matter. You can choose to resist. You can choose to support. You can choose to support fundraisers. What what not? But it's all futile. When in fact, when you you look at Ukraine and you look at all the Ukrainian friends and uh, at you guys as well, and you see that. That resistance, unlikely resistance against all odds facing the most bleakest prospects have been going on for over three years, exactly just because of these extraordinary resistance by ordinary people, not because of the most smartest decisions that our governments made, not because of the um, outpouring of the support uh, with the arms for Ukraine that did not happen for months. But just because of ordinary people showed up for this resistance and keep showing up, so this is the biggest difference between the uh, these mythology and biggest difference between them and us. And I'd wish more people daily just remember that how it's important uh, to sh to do those extraordinary ordinary acts of for ordinary people of resisting or or supporting the resistance. I, I thank you so much for that because so many people right now are feeling like their words don't matter here in America, their efforts don't matter, and that is not true. Despair is always the enemy of action. It all matters. And tomorrow uh, we're going to be interviewing somebody who raised money to deliver five trucks to Ukraine for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we have a friend, Zarina Zabriskie, who's the one who for months worked on getting people to understand there's a human safari going on in Kherson, and we're actually interviewing you on the second anniversary of the liberation of Kherson. And she finally got people to recognize that the Russians were hunting civilians there with drones. And so it, it just all matters. And that that was really what my last question was going to be about. It was going to be about where you talk about solidarity. But before that, can you just give a little shout out about the artwork in this book? That's very special. So a few words about the art and then round it off with some solidarity. Yeah, I thank you so much for this opportunity because this book is actually as a we created together with Ukrainian wartime artists. And for me, it was important to create this book as an art book first. So you open, you have this very almost dry, like factual information about the invasions and texts. And on the other side, there's always a powerful illustration. So over 10 um, Ukrainian wartime artists worked on these illustrations. It was art directed by one of the most prominent Ukrainian artists, Serhii Maidukov. And it was important for me to make this an art book and feature art as much as possible, exactly because of the reason that you mentioned at the beginning. The history and the legacy of the executed renaissance a generation of ukrainian artists and writers and intellectuals that were completely massacred uh, by russian colonial authorities in 1930s completely eradicating uh, one of the most beautiful and dynamic periods in ukrainian culture and they were gone but their art keeps inspiring daily everyone in ukraine including me so in some ways, we wanted to show that in a very Ukrainian way, during the most darkest uh, darkest times, creating art and creating something against odds, against the feeling of heartbreak and um, horror that we're witnessing, is in a way as some sort of a resistance on its own because that art will live and that art will inspire people and that art will tell the story that we're trying to um, come across. And now we're doing these book shows when we travel and you know present the book, but we also uh, do the, um, uh, this, the screenings and projections of this art. And people come and say it to me, you know, Maybe I'm not really educated on all the history facts, or sometimes it's hard for me to even you know sift through so many facts. But when I see those illustrations, something profoundly clicks in me, and I understand that this comes from the place of really powerful story and resistance that I want to learn more about. These this art cannot come um, you know just uh, uh, out of nothing; it carries the power. So that's why. 
you know, I feel like it is important to support Ukrainian artists as much uh, these days and to platform them as often as possible because the stories that this art tells, um, the conditions, unlikely conditions that was created during the bombings and in a very unlikely circumstances uh, is something that everyone can enjoy and benefit and get inspired. Thank you so much. I'm literally sitting here ordering my hard copy as you're talking. And final final words on solidarity and the importance of it. I uh, I feel where when we talk about when we talk during during these times, and especially for you guys, and it's hard for me even to comprehend what you're going through and um there are a lot of you know feelings and emotions and thoughts and soul searching even um that i see in american and my american friends uh these days uh figuring out what's next or what it means i feel still that uh there is so much power that uh you guys have even in these circumstances uh, knowing that you still live in a in a democracy where uh, the right of you know freedom of self expression is still works, where you have platforms, where you have the capacity to amplify the voices, for example, like mine, but also to tell your own story and try for the rest of the world to also understand better what is happening. I think that's important, and it's something that we often kind of uh, not really appreciate. When the real darkness and the real tyranny comes, all of it stops and you have no no opportunity whatsoever. And as someone who actually fought to revolutions, pro-democratic revolutions, um, I really you know, value every day I have an opportunity to speak out and do something and to ensure that the rest of the world is better educated or knows, or even that I have this opportunity, I treat it as a privilege. But I also remember that you know, freedom never comes for free. And as long as we keep fighting for it on in various forms, on various platforms, or just in our own personal ways, that would actually decrease the price we need to pay for it. Uh, because if we stop um, you know, doing that, eventually we'll lose it and then getting it back will be almost um, impossible or it will require tremendous sacrifice. I can't think of a better place to end this. High Fidelity, anything else? That was beautiful. I'm not going to step on that. No, <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us here today. The book is Russian Colonialism 101. You can actually purchase it at your own website. Do you want to give people the information uh, verbally so they know where to find you? Yes, it's uh, it's super simple. It's russiancolonialism.net. Yeah. And you can find all the information about the book there. But you can also find uh, any information on how to support Ukraine and Ukrainian artists um, on my website, uh, maximerstavi.com. Thank you so very much um, for being with us this morning. It was very meaningful and I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, really appreciate it. And Slava Ukraini. Absolutely. Absolutely.